So um, I, I'm Hiro, Hiro Nakahara, uh, from uh, Rick and Brain Science Institute, which locates near in the greater Tokyo area. I was attending this uh, first workshop in Shonan, and I couldn't have a chance to come to second third. I'm very happy to come back. Um, so Riken is a sort of taking style of Max Planck Institute, so having different centers. Our center is Brain Science Institute, Masashi, uh, and others are now uh, in AI Center. So I think I, for this theme of the workshop of deep learning, um, I think deep learning has a center of the deep learning, but also I think has a comprise uh, other uh, fields. I think I'm standing for uh, computational neuroscience aspect and also reinforcement learning aspects. So I'd like to bring you um, some little related, uh, but not perhaps central, but I'd like to give you some view. Uh, I'm hoping to have some stimulations. So uh, my, our laboratory's main interest is computational principles linking brain mechanisms and behavior. The reason we say so is that we to link the, the tremendous complexity behavior and underlying system, in our case, brain, for some people it's a computer, that to, to make sense of them as we believe the computation is a key. So uh, our main field, home ground, is uh, the reinforcement learning uh, and also decision making. Uh, and we are recently extending our work for our social decision making combining reinforcement learning modeling with human function MRI. And then also I kept my interest in neural coding. For instance, there we worked on uh, different issues on population coding, which connects to some of the old work Richard Samuel did. And also we have some works on information geometry for spike analysis, which is, I felt, a little another connection to machine learning. But today I'll be focusing on uh, reinforcement learning topic. So what I'd like to today show you is that uh, uh, how uh, the neural reinforcement learning field uh, is moving forward. And I would like to show you uh, some case of examples how it is changing, uh, how it may, may or may not be related to the, the excitement and people are having with deep learning. So, so to, to move on, I, I'd like to show you uh, some reminder of what's the neural reinforcement learning, what people are excited about uh, brain circuit. Uh, first of all, um, I think most of you know, but perhaps not all of you know, is that uh, reinforcement neural reinforcement learning started the, the uh, 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 discovery or a great proposal made by Wolfram Schultz, uh, Reed Montague, and Peter Dyer, which uh, pointed out uh, dopamine neural response showing here, uh, uh, it looks like uh, uh, temporal difference learning, uh, uh, la learning signal uh, originally proposed by uh, Sutton and Barto, uh, I, I think that was 82. Um, the, I'm not going into the details uh, of this dopamine response, but po the essence is that dopamine response initially before learning, responding to the reward, after the learning, responding only to the uh, stimulus predicting reward. And then it, sometimes after those learning, uh, if the reward is not given, there is a dip of dopamine linear response. That looks like uh, uh, exactly the same structure TD learning signal exhibits. And then given this, people start working on trying to map a different brain circuit how those brain circuits may be uh, construct uh, temporal difference learning as a neural systems. Uh, so I, I, we saw, I think in deep learning context, people often see visual stream brain circuit, uh, early visual cortex to, to uh, temporal uh, uh, cortex. But, uh, and, but people sometimes talk about deep reinforcement learning, but in that case, people don't see so much the neural circuit. But in, in the brain, this basal ganglia circuit uh, combined with prefrontal circuit is considered to implement uh, reinforcement learning systems. 
the basal ganglia sits in where in the middle of the, uh, the brain. Uh, the input nuclei, uh, striatum caudate, will receive the massive input from the cortex and then project back to the output nuclei. Uh, for instance, substantial nigra pass uh, reticulator uh, and GPE, GPI. And also, the, there is a dopamine region called SNC, VTA, that is heavily projecting into that input nuclei and prefrontal cortex. That, that's uh, what people are talking about, uh, neural reinforcement learning. So um, given this, um, what we worked on, one of the things we worked on, we are curious about how the sequential uh, skill uh, or expertise or skill learning is generated. Um, then what we did was, uh, uh, when we did this, uh, there is another uh, interesting anatomical structure, which is the basal ganglia circuit uh, receiving the massive input from the cortex. Furthermore, it looks like there would be a cerebral parallel circuit, which is that after the output nuclei uh, of the basal ganglia, they will project back through the salamus, which I didn't show you here, going back to the different brain region, but when they, it goes back, there are different loop circuit called motor loop, which project back mainly to the motor region, or oculomotor loop, which project back to the oculomotor region, which helps to uh, eye movement, and also project back to prefrontal uh, regions. Uh, and then those regions project somewhat in parallel way to the input neurons. So that's another structure. When we talk about visual stream, for deep learning, and you can also think of how the neural reinforcement learning has some structures. So, and then what we did was to, to try to, uh, to crystallize uh, motor sequence learning or everyday skill learning, we had an experimental setting like this. Uh, just briefly, the, in the experiment, the monkey will be facing, uh, sitting in front of the chamber and looking at this stimulus and four by, f four by four among 16 and bottom, two of them uh, eliminated randomly. What the monkey had to, to discover by trial and error is to which button to push. And if monkey find the pushing button correctly, monkey can move to the next button. So I, I'd like to show you the video of this. Um, Where is the sound? So monkey is finding the bottom, the mistake, correct, second set mistake. Correct, 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 third point mistake. Correct, correct, the third point mistake. Yeah, so succeeded. So if monkey succeed five set uh, consequently, it is a, uh, the correct trial, uh, once a successful trial of the hyperset. Hmm, why? Okay, maybe I should. Right, uh, so now, hmm. now, um, so as you saw, um, monkey will need to discover uh, how, to, uh, how to do correctly, right? Um, every day, what monkey did is to play around around this 20 hyperset. For each hyperset, monkey needs to find uh, uh, how to push them correctly. And then if monkey succeeded to, to correctly pushing the bottom five set, that's one successful hyperset. To finish one hyperset, monkey had to have around 10 or 20 successful trials. Now, as you can imagine, 
this, this task has a combinatoric nature, so people, we can generate uh, so many numbers of hypersets, right? So what monkey did every day, around 20 hypersets, half of them, 10 hypersets, always new. The rest of 10 hypersets, always the same. Now, what we think is, this is sort of extraction of our ev a daily life. Just imagine, like, in, in what way our life is constructed. For instance, if you have a small kids, you kind of know how difficult to wash your teeth while watching the TV, right? You can talk on the phone and while you are changing your clothes. That's easy for you. But for kids, that's extremely difficult. So in other words, our, our life and our intelligence is very, very based upon how the some things you can just so easily and then you can spare your energy or attention or, or, or intelligence to do something else. So we consider this is a, 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 a caricature of our daily life. So now, given this, let's look at how um, that the monkey behaves in this land hyperset. <coughs> so this is one of the things monkey experience every day. That's so quick. And then also monkey, the hand moves go, um, before the next button eliminates. So it is a predictive behavior. Um, so it is as if uh, not really using the in information coming, but it is more predicting where it comes and the pushes. And, and this, this is kind of, um, and then, you know, usually when we say we set the task, sometimes people are not so happy do, doing the task, but monkeys are so happy to do this task. So even like one or two years, we didn't put the monkey on the chamber. When they did this, uh, they are so happy to do it. So. Uh, in, in, uh, and then our daily life is also uh, having this kind of like doing something new, right? Uh, for instance, Klaus, uh, I don't know, he, uh, he does snowboarding, but usually he might be skiing and one day he changed to snowboarding. So um, our life is composed of these two things and the question is how these kind of skills are made up. <coughs> so what we did is that we tried to, to, to train the monkeys and then trying to, to make th some part of the monkey's brain dysfunctioning temporarily, and how those b behavior changes, how the, the, our model uh, is corresponding to it. I'm not going, uh, uh, what I think, uh, I, what I would like to emphasize is it is important to inspect multiple aspects of the correspondence between behavior and neural systems. I'm not going to show you everything, but I'm just showing you to illustrate one, one or two. And then I'll mention what kind of model we did. So first of all, for instance, the monkey had to do the, the, the sequence learning. Uh, so, but if monkey is rather uh, remembering the hyperset, given the button, which button to push, then Let's suppose we um, brought, we bring in a land hyperset and change the order of the set, and then how monkey behaves. So what we, we see is this is the, the performance of the land hyperset. This is the performance of the new hyperset. This is a model. So uh, I'm, I'm sorry. This is a model, and this is an experiment. So the bottom line is that monkey for the well land hyperset, monkey don't really care what input really comes in. They are rather behaving predictively. And this is already different from ordinary way of we are doing neural reinforcement learning. Because neural reinforcement learning, we usually build an actor based upon coming sensory input. Now, for instance, now human has a right-handed or left-handed, uh, et cetera, but monkey doesn't have it usually. But when we let the monkey to do experiment, we let the monkey experience only using one hand, 
for uh, one uh, particular hyperset. And then when we switch the hand, what the monkey's performance became something bit middle between land hyperset and new hyperset. That means that for this uh, well-trained uh, uh, hyperset, monkey's memory is not only abstract or visual, it is effector, uh, in this case, hand dependent. Or uh, when uh, we let the monkey, for, I, I mentioned the visual and um, prefrontal loop and the motor loop. So what we did is using a muskimo, which can temporarily inhibit some part of the brain function. And so when we did this for the part of the visual loop, then monkey could not uh, learn new hypersets well, but monkey did not have trouble with uh, executing with land hyperset. And uh, oppositely, when we, we prohibit some part of the, the, the motor loop, monkey could not do well hyperset, but monkey had no trouble in learning new hyperset. In this way, we also have uh, into the dif uh, gradual differentiation of the circuit uh, for the, the, the motor learning. So the, the bottom line, what we did was, and built, um, it was that uh, the, the same learning can be represented uh, uh, with uh, multiple different representations. And apparently, those multiple representations are, uh, 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 there is a learning speed for the different representations. And uh, gradually, those uh, learning shifted over those wetlands and the, 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 the multiple learning systems. And furthermore, initially, uh, learning is more reactive to coming to the sensory input, but as the learning shifts, it is more becoming predictive uh, uh, learning. Uh, and further, and the, the last stage, there will be uh, also more hand motor coordination with a shorter reaction time. So there is a, a, a shift, even the same sequence learning, the, the natural shift of the different types of learning. So um, it, it is kind of interesting. I wouldn't say this is the same uh, as AlphaGo, but already? Oh, OK, I was thinking, uh, right. <laughs> okay, um, so let's see. So the po point of, uh, of this is a parallel representation for the motor sequence learning. All right, um, what should I do? I was thinking t this is going to be one third. So maybe I'll just go one more quickly and finish. Uh, one, one quickly. So the point... Um, Let's see. So I'm going to skip. Uh, I was preparing talking is uh, sequential, contextual, and social. So I'm going to skip about contextual. But the point of contextual, I just would like to t tell you the result. Um, Neural reinforcement learning, people are talking about often the distinction between model-free and model-based reinforcement learning. And people are talking dopamine neurons as primary model-free reinforcement learning. But recently, uh, we found uh, dopamine neurons can, after extensive training, dopamine neurons can take into account kind of model-based learning signals which implies that uh, model-free, there is a blur boundary between model-free, model-based reinforcement learning uh, supported by dopamine neurons. Um, that's, I thought, another way to be interested in uh, combining to uh, neural reinforcement learning. And the third aspect I wanted to mention to you is uh, social learning. Um, the, the point of social learning is that I think 
if we think of our daily life, uh, large part uh, being a large part of being human is a social behavior. Um, then question is how we can investigate that social reinforcement learning. Um, I think that's in Tommy's way but saying how we can learn in a very small number of samples. But uh, another way to put is how we can take into the knowledge of the social behavior. Uh, we have been doing some efforts of doing it. Uh, the bottom line is that we try to, to, to put reinforcement learning as a model of sort of, uh, of the mind because there is a, a value, real expectation, which is not observable to other people. And also there is a choice probability, which is again, not observable to other people. And we try to extend it to, into the domain uh, on the people's interactions. And how do we do? Uh, we try to build clever experimental tasks and putting them in a human function MRI and we try to, uh, to analyze the behavior by the model, and then using that model parameter, we fit uh, and figure out what the brain signal is, so-called model-based analysis. Here is an, uh, one example that we try to, to, to probe the, the idea of theory of mind. That is, we would simulate other people's mind and try to learn the other's variable. The experimental task we did is very simple. Subject does uh, ordinary value-based decision making. That's a control task. And the main experiment is subject try, another person is doing that value-based decision making. And the subject try to predict what another person is doing that choice. And then we could identify and in, the, in the brain signal uh, reinforcement or, uh, real prediction error of simulate another person in particular brain region. And furthermore, we could actually find that's not sufficient for uh, learning to simulate another person's choice. That another signal is that trying to, <coughs> trying to use the, the prediction of another person's choice, what we call simulate, simulated, as a, uh, simulated as as action prediction error. Thank you. <coughs> so we have time for a couple of quick questions. So I, I have a question. Um, what, 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 I mean, did, did, you, did you transfer like the knowledge which you gained from these experiments to, to deep learning, learning scenarios, for example, in robotics? I mean, could, could you, could you, could you, better train uh, robots by, uh, by Im implementing neural networks or machine learning algorithms by taking um, into account these um, insights which you got from these neuroscience experiments? I'm sorry, say, say again, what the question is? I, I, I wonder if you, if you, um, if you applied these this insights which you, which you got from, from these neuroscience experiments, in um, in machine learning scenarios like like for example robotics, if if, if you you use this knowledge which, which you got from uh, from these neuroscience experiments, so uh, I don't know. Um, so so in, in neuroscience, uh, I think one way is that we try to to find better algorithms looking into somehow modeling the, the, the brain. That's one way, right? Uh, another way is that maybe at, in the sense of more at the computational level, we, we, we try to identify <coughs> what computation must be done. Mm -hmm. I think in, especially when we are working at that level, I'm not sure sometime how we can really go into better algorithm or representation. So I think that's a little bit boundary. I see, I see. Okay. 
So I was wondering if you could say a little more about how you formatted your last part there. I wasn't quite following. So did you say that the, in terms of the other person's reward, or the other per predicting the other person's actions is part of the individual person's reward? So that would be, is that the way you, you formulated reward? So it's not only your own actions and your own, uh, you know, whatever reward you get from yourself, but it's also simulate or trying to model the other person's predictions and getting reward out of that. Is that the idea? So you get social interaction through, through that second kind of reward. Yeah, so, 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 so there, there are different level of about something about others, right? Yeah. So in, in the last part, what we did was that the, the simplest case, when there is other person's reward, the, the subject decision is modified. So, so that means that subject decision itself, decision signal is modified, and where that other information of the other person's reward get into that decision signal. So that's a question we asked. I think that the, the, the point you raised is that, uh, for instance, we might try to predict what the other person might do something else, and how that could be part of the, the value signal how could that be a, a model-based uh, uh, defining a state? So, so there, there are different levels. Actually, this last one is, which I didn't talk about today, but that's uh, something we are also trying. So we are trying to dissect th those different cases. Okay, thanks. <coughs> okay, so thank you very much again. Thank you.